There comes a moment when it's time to say, enough is enough, I can't take it anymore. For me, that moment came during one innocuous weekend in October 2015. What was meant to be a joyous three days turned into the worst three days of my life. We traveled to Arizona because my mother was set to receive the first of her many master's degrees. During the trip, I was stuck in my own mind, trapped in my thoughts and struggling to stay above the water. While she was having the time of her life, beaming from ear to ear and viciously shaking the chancellor or the dean's hand as she received her diploma, I was thinking about the, st the state of mine. I gripped my seat, slowly sinking deeper into my mind as my father and brother jubilantly shouted and clapped at my mother's accomplishment. But first, some background on me. Being the child of immigrants, my parents instilled in me the importance of order when it came to hard work and doing what was needed to attain success and stability for the family. Regardless of how I felt, I should always strive for the absolute best and put money above all else. My parents, older brother and I, immigrated to the United States in 2004 after living in Saudi Arabia, where I was born, and Ireland for a spell. We lived in California <laughs> since 2004, and we all became naturalized citizens in 2012, giving up our Filipino citizenship in the process. My dear mother is a nurse. By all accounts, she has enjoyed her career path, especially considering she's been a nurse longer than I've been alive. But also, it's, a, it's very important to note that nursing wasn't her first choice. Growing up, my mother dabbled in communications, hotel management, and dentistry. However, my grandmother gave her an ultimatum. Focus solely on nursing, or I will stop funding your college journey. So, my mother begrudgingly pursued a career as a nurse, and the rest is history. She willingly gave up her dreams because she felt an obligation to appease her mother. Considering my mother was raised by a single parent in a third world country, it made sense why she would do whatever it took to please the lone breadwinner of the family. Throughout high school, I maintained I would be a nurse or pursue a career in the medical field because my parents repeatedly highlighted the prestige and the money that came with being in the field. In my senior year of high school, though, I was introduced to journalism, and I fell in love. At first, I wondered specifically what it was that drew me to journalism. Mind you, I was never the most talented writer, nor the most accomplished. All I had going for me was that I loved to put my thoughts on a page, however that looked. I also loved sports, and because God graced me with a six-foot wingspan but only made me five-foot-eight, I, I knew my chances of going pro in any sport were pretty slim. And so I combined my love for sports and writing, and voila, I, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. When I approached my parents about pursuing journalism in college and as a career, I was uh, met with derision. My parents, particularly my mother, felt it was asinine that I, a Filipino, would dare pursue a career outside of STEM. Getting laughed out of the room, I told myself to suck it up and be a nurse. My personal feelings be damned. And so, when I began college, I majored in nursing and biology, all to live up to the standards set by my blood and fellow country people. Almost immediately, I knew nursing wasn't the career for me. It's strange. Growing up, I didn't really care for needles, actual blood, or injuries. But, but as I grew older, all of that became the bane of my existence. Seeing blood almost makes me pass out. I can't even look at any sports injuries. The human body is not supposed to break like that. And needles don't even get me started on needles. The way Indiana Jones dislikes snakes, I dislike... <laughs> I dislike needles just as much. <laughs> Pretty strange coming from someone who hears ICU horror stories on a constant basis, right? Whether it was the realization that I was a very squeamish person or the fact that math and science were involved, 
I just knew the medical field wasn't for me. For example, I struggled mightily with math in high school. True story, I was failing my geometry class by about two points, and no matter how hard I tried, I just could not understand the concepts. However, because I built a rapport with my teacher at the time, he rounded my grade up to a 70% flat just so I passed. Shout out Mr. Brindle, wherever you are. Despite the obvious signs I needed a career change before even having a career, I soldiered on. During my freshman year in college, I slowly built up resentment toward what I was doing, my parents, and most of all, myself. I hated myself for putting aside my aspirations to fulfill a dream that wasn't mine, all because of how life was supposed to be for me and my culture. Combined with my struggles in math and science, that resentment and hatred for myself grew. If I got a result that was anything less than what my parents deemed as acceptable in the STEM field, I considered myself a failure. As a result, I became a perfectionist. Not only did I want to get perfect marks on everything, but I also began having ruminating thoughts on how much of a failure I would be if I didn't hit this imaginary goal, regardless of what I did. Early in my sophomore year, about a month or two into the new semester, I knew I couldn't do it. Because of my fear of failure, I would spend all night just trying to understand the concepts. I stopped eating due to stress, and my mind was bombarded with negative thoughts, constantly reminding myself I'm not good enough unless I'm a successful nurse, doctor, or engineer. Yet, I soldiered on, rationalizing with myself this is how it's supposed to be. The struggle I'm dealing with right now will pale in comparison to the money I'll get in the future. Suck it up. What's more, I was always reminded of my parents' struggles to get us to the United States and provide for us. Traveling from country to country to make it to the US and then seeing my mother working three jobs during the Great Recession to keep the family afloat after my father lost his, the least I could do was deal with the thoughts, regardless of how I felt, because in a way, I was doing it for them too. I suppose that line of thinking worked for a few weeks until it didn't. As my headspace deteriorated by the hour, I kept telling myself, suck it up. Don't be a wuss. Men, especially Asian men, don't have these issues. I was in such a bad place that whenever I ate, I immediately felt like vomiting, as if my mind, conspi my mind conspired with my body to reject anything that might help me. I just couldn't focus on anything positive because of the negative ruminating thoughts. What happened after my mother got her diploma is a blur. All I remember is the family deciding to go sightseeing before heading back to California while I, sit in the back, while I sat in the back seat afraid of doing anything because of the uncertainty brought on by my brain. At this point, my headspace had, de had devolved to the point almost every thought centered around death and dying. Because I was in so much mental agony, I figured a permanent solution to a temporary problem was the only way for the thoughts to stop. The next thing I knew, I was in the fetal position crying to my mother about how destructive my mind had become. All I could think about was how this wasn't supposed to happen to me. Asian men, like my father, have long scoffed at the idea that mental illness was an issue. Whenever talk of mental health arose, my father and family dismissed it, calling those who spoke about it crazy, and if I went to the Philippines, I'd find it difficult to find anyone with mental illness because one, people didn't have to deal with that, and two, Asians don't have mental health issues. All we do is work, is work more and push harder to get rid of any thoughts not conducive to success. With this in mind, I fell deeper into the abyss. But before I could get swallowed up by despair, it was my blood that pulled me out. 
On the eight-hour drive home, my mother cradled me, telling me to just hold on while I tried to sleep off the thoughts. My father offered to get me resources to get my mind right and back on the right path, whatever that might be. Once we settled down a tad, I met with a specialist who diagnosed me with generalized anxiety disorder, depression, and obsessive compulsive disorder, all stemming from my experiences. While I was saddened to know that these are lifelong conditions, I was happy knowing the reason why I felt like I wanted to rip my brain apart, OCD. Typically, OCD appears in children ages 10 to 12 and in young adults aged 18 to 25. I was 19 when I was diagnosed. Perhaps the most recognizable form of OCD are compulsions. You know, having to wash things a certain amount of times, locking the car six times, flipping the light switch seven times, and so on. For me, OCD manifests itself mainly through intrusive and ruminating thoughts. These thoughts often are distressing, centered around hurting myself, others, and things of that nature. For instance, I could be driving down the 605 or 91, and even if nothing is happening, I'll have a thought along the lines of, what happens if I just speed up and crash and the car explodes? It's better known as the call of the void. Although it was my own blood that brought me to this place, they also helped bring me out of that spiral. They understood what needed to change and supported my decision to pursue whatever I wanted to do, even though my path differed from theirs. They would rather have me around instead of being another statistic because Lord knows there are too many already. Nowadays, though my family still has a lot to learn regarding the importance of mental wellness, they're more cognizant of my situation and will be there at a moment's notice, should I need help. They've become more understanding, forgiving, and most importantly, open to the idea mental health should be treated similarly to physical health. Thanks to what I learned about myself almost 10 years ago, I've figured out ways to address mental health in a positive way while also using my mental illness as a strength rather than a hindrance. I'm very vocal about my experiences because I don't want anyone else to suffer what I went through in silence. No one needs to walk that journey alone. Thank you. Jared Castillo.